Hello, Booktube. Who's up for a little mail haul? <laughs> little being the operative word for this first one. It's a tiny little thing. Must be a slim volume of poetry. It's, uh... <laughs> it's addressed to Steve Donahue, Vogue Features Director. <laughs> oh, what I wouldn't give if that were true. <laughs> Not only because I have a feeling the, the money would be really good, but because I would do a great job. Vogue right now hasn't always been this way. It hasn't always been the way that it is now. Right now, its assumption is that anyone who cares about fashion has no brain. Uh, so there's virtually no arts coverage of any kind and no book coverage to speak of, really. I would change that in an instant. <laughs> I don't think it would kill such a well-funded magazine to have four pages devoted to books and the latest movies and really good, sharp writing, oh, with their budget at my disposal, the talent I could find. <laughs> but unfortunately, it's just a misprint. <laughs> so, so what have we got here? It is a slim volume of poetry. It is a slim volume of poetry. It's called Rummage, and it's by uh, Ife Chudeni Oputa. It doesn't sound Irish at all. <laughs> so, uh, who who are you when you're at home? Uh, is it this person? Ife Chudeni Oputa is a Cave Canem and Lambda Literary Fellow. Cave Canem is beware of dog. We're not going to get along. <laughs> Her poetry and prose have appeared in or are forthcoming in Matter. Some call it Ballin, Gabby, and the Los Angeles Review of Books. And she lives in Fresno, California. All right, uh, slim volume of poetry to start us off. We'll, uh, we'll move on. We'll move on from there. Uh, let's see, if this is kind of. I glanced at it because I was kind of hoping I'd get another promotion. <laughs> but, but no, this is just plain old me. <laughs> I'm no longer uh, Vogue features editor. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. This is uh, Holding by Graham Norton. It's a novel, I believe it's a debut. Despite the fact that Graham Norton is, uh, yeah, he's a BAFTA-winning comedian and host of one of the United Kingdom's most popular talk shows. Uh, but this, I believe, is, yeah, this is his first novel. Uh, darkly comic and deeply touching. Uh, holding marks the poised and perceptive, according to the Sunday Times, fiction debut of Graham Norton. Set in Norton's native Ireland, this captivating slice of small-town life plays out with suspense and humor as many long-repressed secrets and lies resurface when human remains are unearthed on a building site. Hmm. Okay. All right, so a debut novel uh, from somebody who can probably count on a lot of... Uh, well, actually, he can't count on any publicity in America. He's not known in America. But he uh, the book comes on sale on August the 1st, uh, so I have time to think about it. Uh, and perhaps even read it. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's move on. What do we got here? Vogue features editor. It wouldn't work, BookTube. It's a great dream, but it wouldn't work. They would certainly require me to report to an office on a regular basis, <laughs> and, and probably even move to New York. Because uh, isn't Vogue at Thirty Rock or somewhere nearby? They they. Uh, they don't have an office in Boston, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> that would be kind of pointless. <laughs> uh, oh, look at this face looking at me. Oh, whoopsies. <laughs> oh. All right, this comes out in October. It's called Rescued. What second chance dogs teach us about living with purpose, loving with abandon, and finding joy in the little things. Uh, by uh, Peter Zuitlin, who also did Rescue Road. He's also done... Is that that other the previous book was also about rescue dogs? Uh, he's got a passion, one of the best passions you can have. Uh, one of mine, one of my current dogs. I guess you could both call them, you can call both of them rescue dogs. My beautiful, sleek, intelligent, graceful pointer was rescued from a pound, just not by me, but she eventually came to me. Uh, and I rescued my fat, gassy, stupid basset hound from the street, from traffic. <laughs> so, uh, uh well, anyway, what have we got here? This is from Penguin Random House, and this comes out in October. Uh, I, I'm not 
ordinarily I would just out of a sense of a change of pace, I would be looking forward to October, but it's black as twilight and freezing cold here in Boston with an unending uh, Prussian march of rainstorms and sleet, so uh, there is no functional difference between now and October, so what, what difference does it make to me? I'm not looking forward to October. I'm in October. So, <laughs> uh, But the, the central heat is blasting. There are space heaters everywhere. I'm making sure that no one's exposed flesh is touching you know, any any floor surfaces for any length of time. You know, the usual things you do in mid-May in Boston. <laughs> uh, while many of us have heard the, quote, adopt, don't shop expression, encouraging adoption from animal shelters as opposed to buying them from pet shops, what most people don't realize is just how vast the canine overpopulation problem is. 3.3 million new dogs enter U.S. animal shelters each year. At least 20% of them are euthanized. And these numbers are conservative when you start digging, and oh my god. <laughs> the author is putting it lightly. 20% are euthanized. No, 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 no. <laughs> Just crunch those numbers. Just look at them for a minute, even now, even knowing nothing, if you know nothing about the subject. 3.3 million every year, 20% euthanized. If that were true, there'd be no animal shelters. Or every building in the country would be an animal shelter. No, no, no. The number is much, much, much higher. <laughs> the uh, the animal shelters where I have worked at every Saturday, all the dogs are killed. And the, those cages are completely full by Wednesday. Uh, so, so, yeah, adopt, don't shop. <laughs> the dogs at breeders and purebred places and whatnot have a long list of people behind you you're not helping a dog to be there there's a long list of people behind you who'd be perfectly willing to buy what you're willing to buy so those dogs are going to face their future one way or another but at least they'll have one the, I, I understand the two main problems people have with adopting dogs from uh, rescue shelters and I have them myself uh, the, uh, one of them anyway the first one is the, I've heard many many people say you don't know what you're getting the dog could be a ticking time bomb. It could be a hidden psychopath. <laughs> whenever, whenever a potential customer gives me that line at the shelter, I always try to educate them quickly about canine psychology <laughs> and, and how it's like a Nerf ball. <laughs> it's it's actually extremely difficult to turn a dog in a way that outlasts warmth, regular meals, and a cuddle on the couch. It's actually extremely hard to do that. Uh, they are much more emotionally resilient species than human. Uh, the second reason that a lot of people don't like adopting from animal shelters, I agree with completely and have argued with many animal shelters about, and that is the knee-jerk fascism that is exercised by those shelters. That you need not only your current, a copy of your current lease, if your landlord is willing to let you rent, it's not good enough that you have a signed agreement, your landlord has to come in person. We need a copy of your last lease. We need your vet records going back 35 years. You have to agree to surprise unannounced home inspections for the next year. <laughs> I understand their motivation. There's nothing more heartbreaking than adopting out a dog and having that same dog come back a few days later. It's utterly heartbreakingly miserable for the dog and it's horrible for the people who are there who all love dogs so they they implement these fascistic rules to try and prevent it and uh it's a little annoying i could understand why someone looking for a dog might not want to go through that especially when they they rightly believe they're doing a dog a favor uh and the shelter a favor but you know the way i know when those kind of rules are far too excessive is when i think of applying them to myself and the two of the shelters that I know of, that I, whose rules I know backwards and forwards here in Boston, I couldn't get approved to, to adopt a dog. I would have to go to extraordinary lengths. I would have to beg to adopt a dog who's otherwise going to die. <laughs> and the shelter could know all there is to know about me, and it wouldn't matter. They've got their rules. I'm just following orders. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, uh, there are an estimated 78 million pet dogs in the U.S., less than a quarter of which were obtained from rescues and shelters. In his New York Times best-selling book, Rescue Road, uh, the author introduced us to uh, rescue road trips and the remarkable heartwarming story of how one man and many selfless volunteers saved over 30,000 hard luck dogs from the South. Um, look them up if you're, if you're in the market. 
the, there's they're not the only rescue roads is not the only one there are other uh, outfits designed to transport dogs from ruthlessly high kill areas like the south and the american west uh to the west coast or the east coast uh <laughs> where presumably people are more uh, you know, the, the rules here are much tighter so you you're unlikely to go down a country road in Duxbury and see a sign that says free puppies that's almost certainly not going to happen whereas in the south you will see that so uh uh or maybe you won't anymore maybe all of this is ancient knowledge <laughs> uh, so anyway this is this is a book about rescue dogs wonderful very nice <laughs> all right uh all right, let's move on. Let's see what we have here. Uh, oh, great. All right, fantastic. This is a second copy of uh, something we've seen on this channel before. Uh, this is due next week. It's Sting Like a Bee by Lee Montville. Uh, about the Muhammad Ali, who was the greatest athlete in the world and full of bluster, but not the cuddly, friendly, charming Muhammad Ali. More uh, uh, someone who had been... Uh, Awakened to political courage, no matter what you think of the courage, no matter whether you, what you, whether you agree with it or not, it just flat out made him a more interesting man, and that's uh, the book captures that perfectly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, uh, on we go. Oh, oh, very nice. Oh my, very nice. <laughs> it's the Essex Serpent. Is that beautiful cover? I was so worried that the, this is the, uh, the an advanced copy of the U.S. edition of the, the novel that was a hit in England, uh, in large part because of the U.K. booktubers that we all love, uh, all of whom love this book and talked about it endlessly. And uh, not endlessly, I should put it that way. <laughs> I certainly loved listening to them <laughs> at whatever length they want to go to. They don't watch my channel, so what does it make what I say? Uh, uh, permanently scared off by that hashtag nonsense. It's a shame because I love their channels, but what are you going to do? Uh, but this is, this is, uh, it comes with, a, it's due in, in June in this country, and it comes with a sheet of, of uh, praise from uh, the UK, and it's a great book. I couldn't wait. I saw, it was one, actually, it was one, a, a perfect example of a YouTube book. I saw it on so many channels who's, who's, of people whose tastes I like that I, I got a copy, uh, and it was on my much venerated Steve Reed's year-end list. Uh, but I, I was when I was thinking about the, the U.S. edition, I was so worried that they would ruin the cover, that they would change it to some those, these brutalist, minimalist U.S. covers. But no, they kept it great, fantastic. Uh, oh, great, The Essex Serpent in America. I wonder if it'll do well in this country. I, I I could see I could see uh, reasons why it wouldn't as well as reasons why it would. So, uh, <clears throat> oh my, okay, uh, Kingdom of Olives and Ash, writers confront the occupation. Oh my, edited by Michael Chabon and Ilet Waldman. This is about uh, a renowned novelist and essayist have teamed up with the Israeli NGO Breaking the Silence, an organization comprised of former Israeli soldiers who served in the occupied territories and saw firsthand the injustice there, and a host of illustrious writers to tell the stories of the people on the ground. Oh my. Colin McCann, Jacqueline Woodson, Colin Tobin, Geraldine Brooks, Dave Eggers, Harry Kunzru, Mario Vargas Llosa. Uh, wow. Okay, so... A big, difficult anthology to read. It's a subject about which I have read a great deal. And it's, it's, uh, this is due in late May. Uh, I wonder, is this going to be a paperback? Yes, it is. Okay, this is going to be a paperback. Uh, I haven't, I've seen it, uh, advanced word for it. I haven't actually dipped into it, so I don't know how good this would be if you don't know anything about the problem. But as we've mentioned on this channel before, you have Wikipedia uh, and there are a whole bunch of YouTube videos. <laughs> I could make you a playlist a mile long. Uh, uh, let's see here. But it, if you know something about the subject or you, you're willing to do that background, you have time before late May. This will be a, an incredible anthology to read. Uh, what have we got here? 
Oh, it's another novel, and I think it's another debut. Uh, this is North Haven by Sarah Moriarty. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is a debut. On sale on the 1st of June. Uh, eloquently written and masterfully crafted. Sarah Moriarty. Okay. That's a dangler. That is a misplaced modifier. Sarah Moriarty is not eloquently written and masterfully crafted. <laughs> In English, the next thing after that comma has to be the thing to which that phrase refers. If it doesn't, you are committing an error and making your sentence read poorly. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, the uh, the masterfully crafted Sarah Moriarty brings readers to an island off the coast of Maine where a family's legacy is threatened by hidden secrets, sibling rivalry, and the veracity of memory. Sounds a lot like the other debut. Oh, what well, was with these hidden secrets? Jeez. <laughs> like these people aren't Boston Irish Catholic at all. Our secrets aren't hidden. They're aired ritualistically every single Thanksgiving. <laughs> all right. Uh, okay, this is due... Uh, in June, it's a it's another debut novel. All right, all right. Keys <laughs> It's hilarious. I keep looking at the envelopes now. I never do that. You know, I never do that. You've seen that I don't do that. But since my my momentary uh, promotion to features editor at Vogue, now I'm looking at all these things. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping I get back in the game, baby. <laughs> oh. A big glossy magazine with money behind it. Mm. I wouldn't move to New York. I can't. I'm caretaking two elderly people who can barely get to the end of the driveway. I wouldn't do it. But maybe there'd be a deal to be worked out, possibly. Or I could do the work from here. I'm perfectly handy with FaceTime now. I, I, I work like a drover's horse. I... No, no, it was just a misprint. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Next one is another novel, The Trick by Emanuel Bergman. Uh, a novel of hope, humor, and family. Don't tell me, let me guess. Repressed memories. <laughs> oh, and it's another debut. Uh, wow. Uh, by journalist and translator Emanuel Bergman, who uses his talent for words and imagery. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's... I don't see why that's connected with him being a journalist and a translator, <laughs> since journalists have no talent for words and imagery, and I've just heard horror stories that confirm earlier horror stories about what translators do with the language. <laughs> Maybe he comes by them on his own, and we're just supposed to intuit that. Uh, uh, is the unforgettable story of a small boy who believes in everything, and an old man who believes in nothing. Oh. And in the movie, they'll both be played by that dreamy Ryan Gosling. <sighs> Set in early 20th century Prague and modern-day Los Angeles, the trick blends a gripping World War II story with lyrical writing and a dash of humor, and maybe just a pinch of oregano. <laughs> Reminiscent of the Oscar award-winning movie, Life is Beautiful. So this thing isn't even, it isn't even being pitched as a book. <laughs> the, the, the intermediary step is viewed as too tedious. It's being pitched for the screenplay it will certainly be. <laughs> Maybe I spoke too soon about Ryan Gosling. All right, so this comes out in, in late September when it will be dark and freezing cold. Oh, wait. All right. <laughs> On we go. What have we here? What's next? Oh, this is a twofer. Oh, okay. This is one we saw before. Black Mad Wheel. A second copy of Black Mad Wheel. Gotta show you the author again. Sup. <laughs> uh, there's something else in here. Uh, oh, She Rides Shotgun. A novel by Jordan Harper. There's the two-bit flea bag motel. The type that features prominent me in my love story with Deb. <laughs> uh, Jordan Harper is the author of Love and Other Wounds. He has been a music journalist, film critic, and TV writer. Born and educated in Missouri, he now lives in Los Angeles. Okay. So, bourbon and tobacco. Uh, don't tell me this is another debut. Oh, no, no. Love and Other Wounds is... I don't know what it is, but it's... it's, it's, it's... All right. 11-year-old uh, Polly McCluskey is shy, too old for the teddy bear she carries with her everywhere when she is unexpectedly... Reunited with her father, Nate, fresh out of jail and driving a stolen car. 
He takes her from the front of her school into the world of robbery, violence, and constant threat of death. And he does it to save her life. Okay. All right. High octane. High octane hicklet. Uh, let's, so let's, let's move on here. Rather fiction heavy haul so far. No, no sign of the Ottoman Empire at all. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, in the shadows of the American century, the rise and decline of U.S. global power by Alfred McCoy. There's a stealth bomber on the cover. Hmm. From Haymarket Books. Uh, in, it comes out in late September. In a completely original analysis, prize-winning historian Alfred McCoy explores America's rise as a world power from the 1890s through the Cold War and its bid to extend its hegemony deep into the 21st century through a fusion of cyber war, space warfare, trade packs, and military alliances. McCoy then analyzes the marquee instruments of U.S. hegemony, covert intervention, client elites, psychological torture, and worldwide surveillance. So he's not a fan, I'm guessing. <laughs> Peeling back layers of secrecy, McCoy exposes a, a military and economic battle for global domination fought in the shadows, largely unknown to those outside the highest rungs of power. Can the United States extend the American century, or will China guide the globe for the next hundred years? McCoy devotes his final chapter to these questions, boldly laying out a series of scenarios that could lead to the end of Washington's world domination by 2030. Hmm, okay. All right. Uh, hmm. All right. Uh, it's always interesting to me when people make analyses like that. America is a monolith. It's, it's the whole of the world's economy, it's the whole of the world's market, it's the whole of the world's military might, it's the whole of the world's cultural sway. I'm, I'm, there are plenty of other nations in the world, there are plenty of, there's plenty of other players on the field. But I never know what to do, I never know what to make of analyses like that. The comparison, in terms of scope, is almost not worth making. And when you get... I'm not saying there's any virtue involved in that, but when you get a power that big, a power that much greater than all the other powers combined or separately, the end doesn't happen between now and 2030. The end is not a what you want to be thinking about. What you want to be thinking about is the fact that the, if every single person walking around in Byzantium in the 6th century considered themselves a Roman not a Byzantine. They, they, that's how these things happen. They don't... <laughs> when a power is this big, it, it changes the way rain seeps into the groundwater and becomes something else, becomes a plant. It doesn't change by 2030 because this is the thing that's going to do it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just, when you amass this much power, that's, it, it tends to act in an organic way. But I, well, we'll see. Maybe the author's right and I'm wrong. <laughs> I mean, there's a reason behind the fact that it's black as night and freezing cold in Boston in May. <laughs> uh, but anyway, anyway, uh, this next one is a finished copy of something I think we've seen on this channel before. This is Hugh Bicheno, uh, Blood Royal. It's about the battles of York and Lancaster, the battles of the, of the Wars of the Roses, in a finished copy. Uh, and this comes out on June 6th. Uh, and it's, it, I, uh, I had, I read the advanced copy. I'll gladly read it again, though, because this will have all of the uh, tables and all sorts of uh, research material that wasn't in the, the advanced copy. But it's, it's uh, exactly what it says, which is kind of rare for Wars of the Roses thing. They like to wander all over the map, but this is actually just a straightforward military history, and it's really good. <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, let's, uh, let's go on here. What's this next one? Oh, there's a note. Oh, <laughs> it's one world. They always they always uh, include a very friendly note. So this is what? Uh, the Biggest Prison on Earth by Elan Pappy. Uh, 
who is referred to on the cover as Israel's bravest, most principled, and most inc incisive historian. And it's a history of the occupied territories. So we're, we're back to, uh, to Palestine. Hmm. Based on groundbreaking archival research, NGO records, again, uh, and eyewitness accounts, uh, Pappy's investigation of the bureaucracy of evil explores the, brutal, the brutalizing effects of occupation from the systematic abuse of human and civic rights the IDF roadblocks, mass arrests, and house searches, to forced population transfer, the settlers, and the infamous wall that is rapidly returning the West Bank into an open prison. Hmm. Okay, so this is due uh, in August, and it has, I, I wish that pictures like the one on the cover weren't so common as, as now to be almost cliche, because that's heartbreaking. Uh, that should break your heart. Uh, but we see these pictures on every one of these books now. So, it, hmm. All right, so looks like some reading about the occupied territories in my future and, and getting back into that question. Uh, hmm. Hmm. I, <clears throat> I would be willing to bet that I'm the only booktuber who's been there uh, and talk to people. And it's... Uh, Anyway, all right, let's let's uh, let's move on here. Uh, the next one is um, this is going to be a trade paperback original. Good. It comes out in September. And it is called Border, A Journey to the Edge of Europe. <clears throat> By Kapka Kasabova. I wish my name were Kapka Kasabova. A brilliantly reported and rare solo journey along the border of Bulgaria, Turkey, and Greece. In this extraordinary work of narrative reportage, the author returns to her home country of Bulgaria and embarks on a journey along the border it shares with Turkey and Greece. Capturing the ancient history of the border zone, shaped by the Soviet and Ottoman empires, Kasabova tells the astounding stories of those she meets along the way. Border guards, mountain villagers, fire walkers, entrepreneurs, smugglers, mystic healers, and migrants. From previously unknown Cold War history to the current refugee crisis, Kasabova's voyage into the region of many layered past is an immersive and illuminating look at the physical realities of borders huh okay very nice all right i uh once again i have been there <laughs> i have i have been to the godforsaken reasons that this book is about especially the uh turkish bulgaria border which i had i was there for only i think three weeks and i had not one but two scary encounters with with violence with with would-be bandits <laughs> with would-be robbers you know take one look at <clears throat> a gray-haired white guy and think a foolish american <laughs> that happened not once but twice in relatively the same area people almost certainly knew each other <laughs> but i also had uh i also have some very fond memories of turkey so but anyway, uh, anyway, we're going to end with two boxes here. Uh, so we'll... Oh my, this video is long, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't see that coming. Sorry. <laughs> uh, all right, so we've got something from Oxford here uh, called Blood Oil, Tyrants, Violence, and Rules That Run the World by Leif Wenner. This is a uh, paperback. That's, that's what a cover. Good Lord, that's blood oil. When did this come out? It's got a blurb from the Financial Times. Did I miss this the first time? It's got a blurb from Steven Pinker. Yeah, I think I did. Well, let's see what, what the date is here. Yeah, 2016. So I missed it the first time. Hard to imagine I've, I would have forgotten a cover like this. Uh, but it's all about uh, the oil industry. Uh, Book research explores how the resource curse impedes democracy and development. He searches for the hidden global rule that puts shoppers unknowingly into the business with today's most dangerous men and discovers that this same rule historically licensed the slave trade, genocide, and apartheid, setting out a grand strategy for upgrading the global system, for realizing new rules that will make us more secure at home, more trusted abroad, and better able to solve urgent global problems like climate change, Leif Weiner shows leaders, citizens, and consumers how to act today to dissolve tomorrow's crises and how together we can create a more united human future. Okay, uh, so 
All right, so this is due. Do we have a date? Yeah, this is due in a week. It's probably out already in bookstores. Uh, I don't recall reading this originally. That's terrible. I will have to, rec I'll have to remedy that. Uh, and then the, the last item is... Uh, oh, God. Oh, God. I'll collapse here. The last item is the second box. Uh, secured six ways from Sunday, but that's all right. We're ready. We're prepared for boxes that are secured. Sorry about the length of this video. You, I, I <coughs> for some reason, underestimated how much I had here. All right, let's, let's see what this is. To finish out this... Ugh, to finish out our... Oh, <laughs> all right, well, we end on the best of all possible notes. This is the paperback of Nicholas Stargardt's The German War. A nice big thing. <laughs> Subtitled, A Nation Under Arms, 1939 to 1945. I, uh, I reviewed this and loved it. Uh, yeah, a blurb from the Wall Street Journal, from the New York Times Book Review. Another one from the New York Times Book Review, from The Guardian, from the New York Review of Books. The Washington Post, The Economist, good lord, everybody in the world, how wonderful. That's great. It's always great when you can get a big showing like this for, oh, and also mine. <laughs> Son of a gun. My review <laughs> for Open Letters Monthly. In such company. A free online literary journal in this kind of company. That is awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. Wow. All right, well, in this particular instance, allow me to say, go team. <laughs> we, uh, like I mentioned, wow, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, and Open Letters Monthly. <laughs> it's like I mentioned in an earlier video. We punch above our weight. <laughs> All right, so this this paperback uh, comes out, it's in bookstores now, I think, uh, and it, it so the date really doesn't matter, but uh, I cannot recommend it strongly enough, so... If you if you're in the bookstores and you're looking for a one a big one volume uh, history of the Nazis at war, uh, you can't go wrong with this. Uh, so there you go. We we ended with two big uh, paperback releases, but I don't know if I can lift all these things, <laughs> and I don't know if we have time for a recap. <laughs> Like one of those horrible, like one of those horrible fake YouTubers. There's the hall like this on their, their carefully crafted thumbnail. Oh my god! <laughs> I, I, my only defense being that one you've heard on this channel before. This is work. I am going to dig up to my elbows in these things. There's nothing fake about it. They're not going to go on a shelf and get ignored until they're unhauled. <laughs> but, uh, wow, that's fantastic. All right, so what do we have here? As long as we're running long here, we might as well take a look-see. Uh, we have, uh, let's see here, so history, travel logs, two books on the Palestinian occupation, lots of fiction, including, I think, three debuts. Uh, the, the U.S. edition of The Essex Serpent, uh, second copy of Sting Like a Bee, uh, wonderful, and, and uh, an open letters blurb right there where it belongs, with the big leagues. <laughs> Fantastic. Sorry, that last bit's going to make my day, so I'll, I'll, I'll mosey off and be insufferable elsewhere. <laughs> uh, but I'll see you soon, book two. Thank you.